Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we are streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, and you can watch these videos anytime afterward on both those platforms as well. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone. The exhibit Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley Let the World See has opened upstairs and will run through May 14th. Admission to the exhibit is included with your ticket to these museums. And on Thursday, April 6th, at 11 a.m., we'll have a gallery talk led by our own Olivia Williams, who will discuss the Emmett Till generation and their involvement in the civil rights movement. Um, then at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, April 11th, we'll have an Evening for Mothers program with guided tours of the exhibit, which showcases Mamie Till Mobley's pursuit of justice for her son. That pre-event will have refreshments by Nick Wallace Culinary. Uh, both are free and open to the public. You don't need reservations for either one. Just show up. And then I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History is Lunch when Mary Emma Graham will discuss her new biography of Margaret Walker. We've been waiting on that one for years and we're excited to have you. Today, I am delighted to welcome Annette Drefser to discuss her book, Exposing Mississippi, Eudora Welty's Photographic Reflections. Annette Drefser is professor of English at the University of Mississippi. She earned her MA and PhD from Tulane University. Dresser is author of Disturbing Indians, The Archaeology of Southern Fiction, and co-editor of the works Global Faulkner, Faulkner's Sexualities, Faulkner and Mystery, Faulkner and Formalism, Returns of the Text, and Faulkner and the Native South, all published by University Press of Mississippi. Help me welcome Annette Dresser. <laughs> Thank you for your introduction, Chris. Um, I want to thank Chris and his colleagues at the Department of Archives and History uh, for inviting me today. It's very special for me to talk to a Jackson audience about Eudora Welty. I'm quite aware of the pressure that comes with that. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to thank um, those who went before me with really important scholarship on Eudora Welty especially Dr. Suzanne Morris, Eudora Welty's authorized biographer, Dr. Pearl McHaney, who's done a lot of work on Welty's photography, Dr. Harriet Pollack, who is the series editor for a new series on Eudora Welty with the University Press of Mississippi. I wanted to thank um, Chris's colleagues over in archives and history, especially um, the really good stewards of the Eudora Welty collection, Betty Usman and Forrest Gailey, who have sadly now retired. I couldn't have done this work without their assistance. And I want to thank the press for having produced such a beautiful book. And I want to thank you all for sharing your lunch break with me today. Thank you. <laughs> so let me see if this is going to work. Oh, I already got it wrong. OK. So I take the title for my book, Exposing Mississippi, Eudora Welty's Photographic Reflections, from Eudora Welty herself. Eudora Welty said, if exposure is essential, still more so is the reflection. So what I want to do today is I want to um, go quickly through some facts about her photography that are important for us to know and understand um, to understand Welty's photography, and then I want to talk about my argument a little bit in the book, and then I want to show you some examples, um, hopefully supporting my argument. So, um, so bear with me. Now, my book centers on Eudora Welty's photographic representations of Mississippi. For my research, I spend a lot of time next door uh, in the Welty collection at the University Department of Archives and History, where all of her photographic negatives are safely kept in a cool, safe place downstairs. Of the total 1,063 photographs in Welty's archive, um, only about 300 have been printed to date. Uh, they've been printed, exhibited, or published um, to this day. So I, when I started my work, I was curious about the, the totality of Welty's photographic work 
and I'm excited to share some of the photographs in this book that have never before been published. My book sets the stage for understanding Welty's, the historical significance of Welty's photography of locations. Although Welty traveled to places outside of Mississippi and took photographs there, including trips to Mexico and Europe and visits to New Orleans, San Francisco, Charleston, and New York, she concentrated her photographic efforts on her home state. Um, about 80% of the photographs are taken in Mississippi, um, many during the 1930s, at a time when President Franklin de Roosevelt famously labeled the South the, nation num the nation's number one economic problem. Uh, Mississippi then was a largely agricultural state, um, and it had also been a place where social segregation was inscribed in the landscape and institutionalized in public spaces. So Welty's photographs taken in Mississippi and off Mississippi are invariably in conversation with the particularities of the place, including perhaps notions of Southern exceptionalism, regional and racial objection, and anti-modernity real or imagined. Now, I'm getting used to this. One second, how to hope to hold it. Okay, so. Um, the 1930s was also a time when professional photography as an art form was still a controversial topic and personal photography was a young enterprise for the middle classes who could afford a camera. In the Welty household, her father Christian Welty not only owned a camera, a uh, folding Kodak that was brought out for Christmas, birthdays and trips, as Welty recalls, but he supported the establishment of the first camera store in Jackson, Standard Photo. Welty received her first camera, a Kodak Brownie, in 1922, which she used to take photographs of family events and friends. In 1930, home from college, she began to experiment with artistic compositions and learned to see light and shadow, lines and patterns, and as Welty became more proficient with the equipment, she used her camera for photographic endeavors beyond personal recording to document the cultural landscape around her. So she was increasingly serious about photography, is what I'm trying to say. And with that seriousness, she began upgrading her equipment. Welty worked with three cameras in the 1930s, an Eastman Kodak with a bellows that she used prior to 1935, a Recomar camera she used between 1935 and 1936, and a Rolleiflex, her beloved camera, that she used post-1936. This is important for us to know because Welty's photographs can be roughly dated by the negatives from her different cameras. <laughs> okay. Now, we can also grasp her professional aspirations by her attempts to exhibit and sell her photographs in the 1930s. She showed her photography in Jackson, Mississippi in 1934 at the annual state fair when she was just about 23 years old. A year later, she exhibited her work at Chapel Hill and she had two photography exhibitions in New York City in 1936 and 1937. She applied to study with the well-known professional photographer, Berenice Abbott. She wrote a letter in August of 1934. And she also applied to Roy T. Reed, who headed the regional division of the FSA in 1936. She tried to market a photo book titled Black Saturday that she proposed to two publishers in New York. It was never published, unfortunately. And she contributed photographs to the WPA Guide to the Magnolia State, which came out in 1938. And she had photographs in Life magazine and Vogue. However, <laughs> it was not until 1971 when she published her first book of photography uh, that she received recognition. Eudora Welty's 1971 publication, One Time, One Place, Mississippi in the Depression, a snapshot album, revealed an accomplished photographer and garnered serious critical considerations of her visual art. 
Welty's first photo book garnered positive reviews, and here is the deal, an invitation by the director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, John Sarkowski, the visionary curator who set the course of both photography history and appreciation in his 30-year um, career at MoMA. So John Zarkowski is widely acknowledged as the curator who almost single-handedly elevated photography status in the half century to that of a fine art, um, making his case in seminal writings and landmark exhibitions. Now, prior to the invitation to Eudora Welty, some of these exhibitions included major retrospectives of the work of André Cartes, Dorothea Lange, Cartier-Bresson, Brassailles, Bill Brandt, Eugene Agé, and also Walker Evans. Sarkowski, and I, this is why we're talking about him a little bit, Sarkowski was daring and controversial when he showed the transgressive work of Diane Arbus to a storm of criticism, presented casual street photography and documentary images for art appreciation, and staged a color photography exhibition by a then unknown photographer from Tennessee, William Eggleston. In short, John Sarkowski curated and canonized almost every well-known photographer that we have heard of today. So when John Sarkowski invited Eudora Welty to the Museum of Modern Art for a lecture on her photography, this was an extraordinary recognition of her visual talent by the nation's foremost curator and critic of photography. Now, giving directions for the, le for the lecture, he wrote to her, her and he said, it would be good to hear you read some of these pictures, indicating what is in fact described in them and what might be inferred from them and what existed in the subject is not visible in the pictures. What photography really is for is still pretty much of a mystery, even within the trade, perhaps especially within the trade. And answering Welty's worries <coughs> about the quality of her photographs, he assured her, I hope that you will not spend any time worrying about not being an expert. I've known lots of photography experts, I'm even one myself, and can therefore say authoritatively that photography is so rich, so complex and simple that no one understands it at all. For all of us, the subject is a tabula rasa. His assessment of photography shared informally and frankly with Welty is corroborated in his influential book, Looking at Photographs, 100 Pictures from the Collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the 1973 study that defines the history of photography as a specific disciplinary enterprise. Photography as a medium, he writes, has received little serious study and the reason is that the commonplaceness of photography and the radical differences between it and the traditional arts has made it, he calls it, a refractory problem for theorists and one that has not submitted with grace to the traditional intellectual apparatus of art historical study. So in defining the history of photography, Sarkowski felt that he had to look back and forth all at once because photography had grown, he says, like an untended garden, by which he meant that several generations of photographic thought have existed simultaneously. Thus collecting photographs, again, Sarkowski, is filled with mysteries and contradictions and unexpected adventures. Now, from his vantage point in the early 1970s, much remained to be discovered about 19th century photography, for instance, even as the medium was constantly developing in the present. He sums up by calling photography the most radical, instructive, disruptive, influential, problematic, and astonishing phenomena of the modern epoch. So, that is a great quote. So, in my book, I show that Welty used the radical, 
instructive, disruptive potential of photography as art and social commentary to offer her own unique vision. <coughs> she sees the medium's influential power to intervene in conventional ways of seeing and seeing the people and places in Mississippi. She was aware of the problematic um, dimensions of photography for propaganda and advertising, but open to new technologies of vision and in taking exposures of Mississippi, she contributed invaluable images to the astonishing discipline of modern photography. Welty began photographing in Mississippi at a time, also that's important, when the first photographs found their way into the Museum of Modern Art. The museum acquired its first photograph in April of 1930. It was a photograph by Walker Evans, indeed, and opened its inaugural um, survey, I mean, historical survey exhibition, Photography, 1839 to 1937, curated by the famous art historian Beaumont Newhall, which began the museum's coherent commitment to photography. So, Welty published One Time, One Place in 1971, the same year that Walker Evans had its retrospective at the museum, and the Depression era photography underwent a major artistic revaluation. In the wake of Walker Evans' exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, Welty showed her own photographs taken during the Depression in the lecture series Photography, Points of View in November of 1973. <coughs> Excuse me. She selected 32 of her photographs from one time on place and included comments from the introduction uh, to her book in her lecture. Now, this is a long way about, but I begin with this nexus of events to highlight the national recognition of Welty's visual work and its intersection with major moments in photographic history. I also wish to emphasize that the photographs that Welty took in the 1930s and published beginning in the 1970s bracket and frame her career as a fiction writer. So to say it more simply, what comes first and what comes last is Welty's photography. I offer this trajectory as a correction to the prevalent idea that Welty took some snapshots before she found her true calling as a renowned fiction writer. My work treats the photographs not as a prequel to her vacation as a writer. Instead, it is invested in understanding Eudora Welty as a photographer whose art offers a passionate and political vision of life in the South. In the six chapters of my book, I therefore investigate Eudora Welty's vision and argue for her modernity, a visionary modernity. I'll prove this by taking my cues from Welty herself. Tracing Welty's comments about photography in, in letters, interviews, and essays to learn what she liked and disliked, I found that Welty positioned her photographic vision in dialogue with two female photographers of her time. The photographers are Doris Ullman <coughs> and Berenice Abbott. Ullman, a photographer who had trained with Clarence, Wright, Clarence White, was a member of the Pictorial Photographers of America and well known for her photographs of the people of Appalachia, Appalachia and the Gullah Islands of South Carolina. Abbott, a photographer who trained with Man Ray, opposed the picturesque movement, advocating instead a modern documentary vision. She is best known for her book, Changing New York, The Complete WPA Project. So in a sort of polarized and sometimes polemic debate about photography, Welty took a clear stance when she applied to Berenice Abbott's photography class at the New School in 1934, confiding in her letter, I quote, I do not like Omen's pictures. <laughs> Welty's preference for Abbott's photographic style shows 
that she was drawn to a modern documentary photographic aesthetic. So let's look at an example of how Welty and Ullman depict a subject. Oops, um, went backwards, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so the subject is um, two African-American women resting from a day's labor. In both photographs, the white headscarf visually links the women, both in a state of repose. Welty's Washwoman Jackson, included in the workday section of One Time, One Place, is a candid shot that captures the subject in side profile in a moment of rest. Ullman creates a frontal portrait. But the main difference is the photographer's contextualization of their subjects. Welty's image frames the porch and includes the laundry, two wash basins, and a washboard. The inclusion of the cat and the sleeping dog emphasize the shelter of the shady porch. The candid image is formally well composed with a repetition of the round shapes of the tubes and tires. Even though the photograph focuses on a traditional occupation for African-American women or shows a woman at her house having done the laundry, it does not typecast the woman who is caught unaware by the camera as she's enjoying a moment of rest. The encounter between Welty and her subject takes place outdoors. Now, whereas Ullman enters the modest cabin with newspapers for wall coverings and positions her sitter, including positioning her face, hands, and upper torso as she was wont to do. The averted gaze, the prop of the pipe, and the lack of a caption turn this woman into a familiar type from the antebellum South. In a rapidly modernizing world, Ullman wanted to produce a visual record of traditional Southern folk cultures. She was motivated by an effort to preserve what she believed were vanishing population types. By contrast, Welty's vision veered away from stock images, <coughs> and her preference for a handheld camera over the tripod that Ullman used made it possible for Welty to intervene in staged conventional representations of Southern African American identities that Ullman sought to perpetuate. So Welty admired the photography of Berenice Abbott and she wanted to work with her as her application letter showed. Welty approached this young female photographer, only 10 years her senior, I should go back to her image, there she is, um, who had made a name for herself in the art world of the 1920s Paris and Berlin, where she first apprenticed uh, to and later worked with legendary photographer Man Ray, met Alfred Stieglitz, whose style of photography she later rejected and acquired the entire, this is Abbott acquiring the entire photographic archive of Eugène Auger, whom she photographed shortly before he died in 1927. If Abbott's artistic talent, reputation, androgynous beauty, and connections to rich patrons, let me say Peggy Guggenheim was one of her portrait customers, may have been known mostly in circles among the American expatriates and the French intelligentsia, News her of her discovery and acquisition of the Auger archive had arrived in the United States by 1928, before Abbott's actual return to the US. When the Depression started, Abbott tried to rebuild her career by exhibiting and teaching in New York City. So, did Welty see Abbott's work in New York City? I have done a lot of work and I wished I could firmly found a clue, but I haven't. Very likely though, Welty could have seen Abbott's work in some gallery venues, but certainly when Abbott had a show in the Museum of Modern Art and was, renewed and was reviewed in the New York Times and Art News. <coughs> so despite missed personal connections between the two female artists, Abbott provided informal visual mentorship to Welty, who had begun taking photographs on her own. Abbott's monumental visual mapping project of New York City also appealed to Welty, 
who was keenly attuned to the human and built environments of her home state, as well as New York City, where she really liked to spend time and where she took photographs similar in similar locations as Abbott. Um, as Abbott. So Welty and Abbott both documented Lower East Side vendors, unemployed men in Union Square, and the elevated train tracks um, called the L. One second, where am I going? I'm going forward. Did I not go? I did something to my clicker that Chris told me never do. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this, and so now I can't advance it forward. I can't. Front button. It's, uh, hold on one second. It just won't advance anymore. <laughs> this is all going to be on film. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I just keep holding it now. Okay, so here we are. So they both photographed in New York City. Um, okay. So, um, yes, at the time, Abbott and Welty photographed in New York City, the um, L train still sort of rumbled through the city and many neighborhoods until the 1940s, actually, when several train lines were retired and replaced by the subway. So Abbott was on hand to document historical architecture, and Welty used the L as an elevated space, often to shoot down into the city streets or capture its dramatic pattern of shadows underneath. Both photographers took photographs under the L. Among Abbott's photographs of the L is a set-like image of an almost deserted street dipped half in sun and shadow that is dramatic and theatrical. If you take a look, a single woman is standing on the sunny part of the street as a man approaches on the opposite sidewalk. No one else is seen. The human scale is small and overpowered by the steel structure that forms a tunnel of light and shadow under which people move. Abbott mentioned a feeling of menace that the overarching mechanical system produces. Now, Welty too approaches the dominating steel structure and its shadows in Third Avenue L, but her frame, inclusive of the bordering streets on both sides of the tracks, creates a mood that is not as claustrophobic. Drawn to the drama of shadows caused by the L, both photographers experiment with light and design. So by preferring Abbott's photographic realism to Ullman's pictorialism, Welty opted for a modern documentary vision and a candid photographic style um, capable of exposing Manhattan's and Mississippi's cultural geographies. Welty's visual experimentation resonates with street photography, candid photography, and modern forms of documentary art still to be classified, um, still to be classified and understood at the time the photographs were taken. Okay, so this much for her kind of apprenticeship. Now, another important photographic context for Welty's photography is the Farm Security Administration archive. And we might ask, <coughs> how do her photographs compare to FSA photography? Welty's photographs taken in the Depression era South, I would say, show both similarities and differences with the FSA archive. Um, Welty did not want us to think that her photographs were taken for the WPA. So therefore she said, in snapping these pictures, I was acting completely on my own. They have nothing to do with the WPA. Um, but like, I mean, but Welty's photographs of evidence uh, images much like Stryker's um, photographers. So Stryker sent out photographers to document poverty and economic hardship whereas Welty captured the poverty she encountered, but downplayed a polemical reason for doing so. She said, I did not take these pictures to prove anything. Yet, in terms of subject matter, there are many similarities between Eudora Welty's photographs and FSA photographs taken in Mississippi, for instance, photographs by Arthur Rustin, Ben Sean, Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang, 
Russell Lee and Marion Post Walcott. For instance, to show a similarity with an FSA photographer's work, we might turn to a photograph by Arthur Rothstein. The first of the FSA cadre to arrive in Mississippi, he took a photograph titled Sharecropper, Lauderdale County, August 1935, of a man in a white cotton sh shirt, wearing a hat and round glasses, and holding a cigarette between his lips. This half-length portrait of the man resonates closely with Welty's similar portrait shot in the same format of the WPA farm-to-market road worker, Lowndes County, who also wears a hat and strikes a match for his cigarette. More specifically, to the concerns of the Resettlement Administration, Stryker asked his photographers to document building projects and land erosion, and Welty's archive actually contains two images of erosion in the community of Learned, Mississippi, as well as images of infrastructure projects that show rows of concrete tubing lying artistically in a landscape. Like Dorothea Lang, who photographed um, a cane press um, in a photograph called Pressing Cane for, Sor for Sorghum in the Carth Carthage vicinity in August of 1938, Welty includes an image of a similar cane press making cane syrup, Madison County, in one time, one place. And although Marion Post Walcott's photograph, Cutting Hair, in front of the plantation store, Milestone, November 1939, shows a version of an informal outdoor barbershop for men with an audience of five men on a low porch in the background of the action. And Welty's photograph, Hairdressing Q, Hines County, depicts a group of five children around the women's hairstyling session on the porch. The subject matter of outdoor grooming is remarkably similar. These and many other visual and thematic correspondences between FSA photography of Mississippi and Welty's photographs might exist in part because over the years, actually, Roy Stryker, the director for the FSA, broadened his agenda from strictly recording the performance of the agency to documenting America more generally. Patty Carr Black suggests that inevitably, as the photographers traveled around the countryside, they began to record extraneous things, places and people that interested them, moved them, or amused them. So as I mentioned, I take my main cue for understanding Welty's photography from the artist herself. The biggest key for me to understand the photographic vision that she has is actually in the 1971 publication, One Time, One Place, because this book and the draft version that is in a binder right across here in the archive um, presents Welty's own selection and sequencing of photographs into the four sections of a book. Those are Workday, Saturday, Sunday, and Portraits. So when I discovered the tight control that Eudora Welty had actually over putting this book together, really curating it, I was then able to kind of like read it as a, a visual narrative that she crafted, or dare I say, plotted by herself. So from her post-civil rights vantage point in the 1970s, Welty does two things in this photo book. She selects photographs that represent the economic, racial, and gendered history of Mississippi during the 1930s. And she confronts the ways the public has come to understand this era and the documentary genre most associated with it. So in compiling her photographs, Welty engages a public historical photographic record readily available to her in publications of the SF FSA photography, um, for instance, but she also chooses photographs based on her personal experience, preference, and memory. Whatever the motivation, Welty deliberately selects each photograph for its narrative potential to show something about the time and the place that she witnessed and documented. So throughout her book, when you really read it as a narrative, as a story, Welty arranges the photographs in the form of a dialogue she places them side by side, 
in thoughtful and pointed sequencing to create narrative threads. For instance, in the Saturday section, <coughs> excuse me, she places to play dolls Jackson, an image of two young African American girls who cradle white dolls in their arms, opposite of the photograph to find plums, Kapaya County. In the photograph of the two girls, the message, I believe, is overtly political as it points to the tragic socialization of black girls in a white culture of beauty and love, bringing to our attention an ironic and painful contrast. The image facing the girls, however, highlights the bond between an African-American mother and her child, dressed up in sun hats and armed with buckets, a large one on the mother's arm and a small one on the child's. This photograph challenges the damaging fabrication of white racial identifications into play dolls. So Welty arranges the plates directly opposite facing each other. As a photo book curated by Welty herself, One Time, One Place is a visual guide to me that helps me see and understand her photographic vision. From here, I begin reading her representations of places and people in three book chapters, each dedicated to a particular uh, local, or, uh, local landscape. So <clears throat> I begin with institutional landscapes, I have a chapter on that, and a look at a photographic archive of places, including architectural landmarks um, and institutional landscapes of Jackson and its surrounding towns. Um, Jackson's two state houses, the what was then called the State Insane Hospital, um, the Governor's Mansion, Livingston Park, Old Confederate Park, the First National Bank, the courthouses in Canton, Pontotoc, Raymond, and Vicksburg. And um, and I'm arguing that Welty trained her lens on these buildings to address questions of political representation and access. I want to show you an example. I know this is a big claim. She, she did this as a sort of overtly conscious move. But let's, like, let's take a look at an example of an institutional landscape. In this photograph, Keep of Grass, the photo shows the courthouse lawn in Pontotoc, Mississippi, occupied by a group of six white men lounging in the shade of the bushes. They blatantly ignore the sign, keep of grass, on which one man confidently rests his leg. The men's privilege and access to the courthouse landscape is well captured. Would an African-American man of that time so blatantly trespass on the small town legal landscape? The photograph then shows a trespassing white crowd's dominance of courthouse space. Public political assembly in the Jim Crow South is a white privilege, and these men are exercising their power and privilege. Waiting for a speaking event to begin, Welty captures this crowd unseen from behind to engage questions of access and privilege. Welty's photographs of institutional landscapes represent rigid spatial hierarchies in the service of hegemonic power. However, she also documents flexible, more flexible cultural and racial spaces. Welty was very fond of photographing street performances in Jackson and in the pop-up spaces of the state fair and the circus that came through town. Um, the circus, confronted Mississippi society oftentimes with non-normative bodies, actions, and acts, and Welty captures these leisure landscapes in photographs that show a degree of racial and social mobility. Attracted to the informal spaces of the state fair, Welty trained her lens on those moments of racial encounters in spaces of a cross-cultural um, middle ground, for instance, in this lovely and never-before-published photograph taken with her Eastman Kodak prior to 1935, Welty captures three teenage boys with a camel, two African-American boys on the outside of a low circus barricade behind which a white teenager, the animal handler, is holding a camel. 
The older of the two boys leans against the barricade as he watches the white boy on the other side tie up the camel. Behind them is the empty circus ring and above them the poster, like leopards, displaying six spotted leopard feet and legs that look like a cross between human and cat. Though separated, the boys are visually drawn together and form a racially mixed group, the young camel at the center illuminated by the sun. This photograph, I feel, is full of drama and the drama of possibility. Welty's eye was definitely drawn to drama and spectacle and what is visible and that is visible even in her exposures of memorial landscapes. So from the beginning of her photography, from when she was still very young and photographed prior to 1935, um, tombs and cemeteries were included in Welty's photographic vision of her environment. In my chapter on memorial landscapes, I establish Welty's cemetery photography as crucial in the framework of her spatial hermeneutic. Welty's interest in Mississippi cemeteries originated with her proximity to and familiarity with Jackson Cemetery, Greenwood. She writes, my family were not old Jackson, so I had no kin buried at Greenwood Cemetery, but I grew up near it. It was the view from the sleeping porch at our house on North Congress Street. We could look right down on it. I used to go over there and play. Her early familiarity with the cemetery as playground is a helpful metaphor for understanding her photography. From the beginning, tombs and cemeteries were included in Welty's vision of the Southern cultural landscape. The Welty Archive holds 142 photographs of cemetery monuments, and Welty published 107 of them in her last photo book, Country Churchyards, published in 2000. So many of the photographs um, were taken, even of those tombstones, were taken in the mid-1930s when Walker Evans and Eudora Welty crossed paths in Mississippi in the Crystal Springs Cemetery. Evans was on photo assignment in, the Missis in Mississippi in December of 1935 um, and during the first three months of 1936. While staying at the Carroll Hotel in Vicksburg, he took several trips and discovered the cemetery in Crystal Springs that Welty also visited. There, Evans photographed the monument Mott in December of 1935, around the same time that Welty took her photographs of Mott and several other monuments. Just imagine Imagine the meeting in the cemetery. Wouldn't that have been fabulous? So Welty and Evans were both drawn to Mott, a unique statue of a young man sitting with his dog on top of a tombstone. Welty first photographed Mott um, with the Re Recomar camera she used between 1935 and 1936, and then later post-1936. In Welty's photograph, the young man sits in a watchful but relaxed pose with arms and legs crossed. His hunting dog is lying down curled close to him, but his head is lifted and both are looking in the same direction. The shot of the monument conveys, the pair that, conveys that the pair is physically and spiritually close. The sculptor's attention to detail is lovely. Check it out. You can see the buttons and cufflinks on the shirt, the wrinkles of the suit jacket, the dog is wearing a collar and his right front paw is ever so slightly curled around the top of the slab. Welty took the photograph from a low angle and a perspective that makes both figures look off into the distance on the left. The pair is framed by a church and a building in the background, none of which higher than the nose of the dog. The sculpted portrait commemorates the bond between the young man and his dog in a strikingly everyday casual life pose. Evans's photograph of the same monument is taken from the front so that both figures look directly into the camera. It is a straight on take, typical of the, his photographic practice and perspective. Lincoln Kirstein characterizes Evans's straight photography not only in technique, but also in the rigorous directness of its way of looking. And as you can see, um, Walker Evans captures also the Southern Cross here right next to the tombstone and once we've discovered that, we see another one actually in the further distance in the uh, photograph. So for Evans, it was important that Mott was coded explicitly as part of a Southern and possibly a Southern Confederate 
geography. For Welty, the unique statue claiming space in the theater of the small town cemetery was a tribute to the artistic talent of the photographer, which was a, I'm sorry, to the artistic talent of the unknown itinerant sculptor. So there are some differing approaches, and I could say more about that. But I want to close by saying something about Eudora Welty's photographic technique. When Welty published One Time, One Place and decided to call it a snapshot album, which she called it that, she chose the term snapshot for images that froze her fleeting encounters with her subjects, the majority of them African-American, and snapped quickly to capture the gesture, the situation, and the connection. She writes, you have to know the moment when you see it. The human face and the human body are eloquent in themselves and stubborn and wayward. And a snapshot is a moment's glimpse into what never stops moving, never ceases to express for itself something of our common feeling. Every feeling waits upon its gesture. The snapshot, I suggest, is intimately related to the ways Welty approached her subject matter. In the segregated South of the 1930s, it was a fitting practice for approaching her subjects and documenting a cultural landscape that was tightly controlled, that was a tightly controlled visual regime. By that I mean it was tightly regulated who could look at whom and for how long. So by the 1970s, it had become a fitting term by which Welty signals a directive for looking, at her photograph uh, for looking at her photographs and evaluating their aesthetic. So last thing, Welty's term snapshot has often been taken to express the modesty of an amateur photographer who was really a writer. However, Welty was interested in and informed about photography as this group now knows and she chose this technical term with insight and strategic purpose. The snapshot is less overtly didactic than documentary photography. It has more in common with street photography in the sense that the photographer approaches people and places in an open and in a spontaneous way. Clive Scott writes that street photography is about eventfulness either in the subject or in the eye and it is driven by curiosity. The notion of curiosity fits well with Welty's motivations for taking photographs. It was to lift the veil, to part a curtain, as she says, that invisible shadow that falls between people, the veil of indifference to each other's presence, each other's wonder, each other's plight. Thank you. We have time. Water. <laughs> First one is uh, Michelle Carroll. She asks, "Who is the Mott or Mots whose sculpture was just discussed? I can't find it online." Yeah, it is actually a cemetery monument in the um, Crystal Springs uh, Cemetery. Um, it is of a young man. We, we know from the dates that are actually on the tombstone. One second, let me find them. Uh, that the young man must have been 26, uh, who's depicted here. Um, so the, the gravestone mot is engraved with the dates 1870 uh, to 1896 and inscribed B. M. Lockwood and the additional date of 1891. So <laughs> I am not sure who Mott is or was. What I'm sure about is that his family um, was wealthy enough to commission a wonderful um, you know, marker and monument um, to the life, I suppose, Mott's life, who died at 26 years old following these dates. And, um, and so Dora Welty was really interested in elaborate and intricate sort of monuments. You know, by the 1930s, when she took Victorian grave marker 
um, photographs, those grave markers would have been sort of outdated. A more modern kind of gravestone, the one that we know today that's kind of polished and smooth and there are no angels and no, <laughs> they're, they're so different, right? So those would have come into vogue. Also, um, by, by the 1930s, Sears Roebuck had a, um, uh, a sort of division where you could just order your grave marker and it would come and, and be delivered um, to your house. So this doesn't answer the question, do I really know who, who Mott is or to, whom, to whose family he belonged? If you have any leads, and if you want to go to the Crystal Springs Cemetery with me, I definitely want to go. <laughs> I would definitely, definitely like to know more about that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really, really um, good question. Um, you know, Eudora Welty, <laughs> here is what we've done as literary scholars, and I'm outing myself now not as an art historical scholar, but as a literary scholar who's like forging her way into photography. <laughs> so, but for literary scholars like myself and my tribe, um, it was a natural move for us initially to sort of read the echoes and the sensibilities that we can take from her photographs into her fiction or that um, you know, her fiction offers to us. Um, Eudora Welty has a lot of references actually, say for instance, to cemeteries in her fiction. Um, and, and so there was a natural, seemingly natural correspondence. But here is the thing. I have scoured Welty's commentary on photography and uh, she has claimed at least in five to six places that photography and fiction are separate disciplines. And no, she did not, she did not, you know, her fiction was not inspired by her photography, nor um, was it the other way around. So she, if you read my book, it's somewhere in the introduction where I'm quoting her five times on fiction and photography are different. And she says, I didn't need photography to create my fiction. She said, memory was a far better guide for me. Um, so there we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Thank you. I would love to sit on the porch at Eudora Welby's home and chat with this woman um, and with you through Crystal Spring Cemetery. <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, don't we all wish that we she was here and we could talk to her about her photography and um, maybe she would even know who Mott was. <laughs> um, yes. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. The ruins. And I just wonder if what gets in, I just wonder if you have any background on that. And, and if I recall, her shadow is in the photograph. Yes. Um, Eudora Welty has several shots actually of the ruins or of the Windsor ruins uh, by Port Gibson. Uh, it was a favorite picnic spot of hers as well. Um, at the time when Eudora Welty was alive and she would have photographed um, Windsor, she oftentimes you know took a blanket and a picnic basket and some of her friends and everybody came out and um, and had a good time um, under the the ruins of this former plantation. Um, so the photograph that you're referring to that shows Eudora Welty's, uh, Eudora Welty takes a photo of the ruins and her own shadow is actually in, on, on the grass. It, so, so I think that's a really important photograph because I read it and Natasha Trethaway actually also refers to it in her uh, introduction to the new edition of photographs, but I sort of read it as Eudora Welty's own shadow being implicated in the kind of plantation history that Windsor ruins, you know, that, that, that are the 
the actual fragments um, of a plantation. So it's, it's very interesting and courageous um, that she includes her shadow in this plantation landscape, as if to say, I have also inherited or I am part of this. The photographer is in this. Um, that is such a, um, a touching photograph. I wished if I was, I don't know, if I had my own computer, I would pull it up now for you all, <laughs> but you can see it in, in photographs. Um, so, um, yeah. The shadow, Welty's shadow in this photograph has oftentimes also been referred to as being angel-like because we see her, um, her outstretched elbows as she was lifting the camera. Um, I'm less sure that that is, uh, you know, a, a productive way of reading it. I like the idea that she's implicating herself in these landscapes that are our plantation landscapes. Um, and that is a really, really good question. Um, where else can her shadow be seen? Not that I know of in any, maybe somebody else knows there is a hand in the audience. It's in a store window. Yes, where we can also see her shadow. Um, yeah, so it is an extraordinary move and she's taken a lot of pictures of Windsor. Um, one where she's standing, well, actually one that was taken of her where she's standing by a barbed wire and the, the runes are in the background. Um, but that's not her taking the photograph, of course, because she, she's in it. But, um, yeah. Question here, we've also got a little comment from the live stream. Judith Payne says, I believe Wealthy had a more compassionate eye than her contemporaries, despite being a southern white woman steeped in Jim Crow, Mississippi. Wealthy saw the humanity of the oppressed and never failed to photograph them in context of their full existence. Even in tattered clothing and manual labor tools, she allowed each student, uh, pardon me, she allowed each subject their dignity. This is back, back to uh, Vincent Mott Lockwood. Um, this is a lot of information, but I added him to findagrave.com. Thank you. 2006. <laughs> And I noticed somebody sent uh, links to his father, his ch eight, one child, and siblings. So that's not much information. But anyway, if you look on findagrave.com, you can find a, a little bit about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Yeah, so Eudora Welty was working briefly for the WPA, but not as a photographer. From, I believe it was June 1936 to November 1936, Eudora Welty, in the midst of the Depression, had applied for a job, and she wanted, as I mentioned, to, she'd applied to Roy T. Reed to the photographic division, but she did not get this job. Um, but she did get a job as a junior publicity officer or agent. And so what she did for six months of that summer, um, she walked around from uh, one work site to the next um, WPA uh, work site to report on progress, to report on how it was going. And she said, um, soon enough, this was so interesting, going around, you know, Mississippi, um, documenting and writing about uh, progress that was being made. Soon enough, I took my camera with me. But she wasn't paid um, by, you know, by the government for taking photographs the way other uh, WPA photographers uh, were paid. Nor did she, and this is really good, nor did she work to a script. So um, photographers who were hired to work for the FSA, um, they responded and were responsible to, um, to Roy Stryker. And Roy Stryker looked at all of their photographs and said, okay, this meets the purpose and this doesn't, and I want you to photograph more. Crowds of people in front of courthouses, I want you to photograph train stations, I want you to photograph, so there's a whole list of of admissible and possible photographic subjects 
um, that he supplied his photographers with. So they were supposed to go out and do all of this. It's so interesting to think, had Eudora Welty been hired by the WPA, by the FSA, what photos would she have taken? You know what I'm saying? Not only would she have been the only Southern photographer working on the South, but what would she have done? You know, I mean, that puzzles us and, 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 and it's such an intricate sort of question, I mean, an interesting question. Would she have taken the same photographs or what would she have done with some of those scripts? Um, so yeah, so she was a junior publicity agent for half a year and a photographer in her own right, on her own time, um, you know, although actually, actually for a while she was on their time, but also taking photographs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say that the other guys were, you know, especially Walker Evans, straight, straight on photographers. And she, I don't know, she saw mystery and drama and beauty and, and according to that. We, we never know, like, why did Eudora Welty take a particular photograph, but we, we can read in the framing and in the way in which she takes it, maybe what she saw and what she intended. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, so, you know, Walty actually makes her way into next week's program as well. Uh, she was friends with Margaret Walker near the end of her life, and that is something that's dealt with in Graham Graham's book. Uh, mm -hmm. She'll be here to talk about it next week. We have copies of Annette's fantastic University Press Mississippi book for sale over here, um, where she really does take a deep dive into Welty, her photography, her vision, and uh, what compelled her with all of it. Uh, and if you didn't have a chance to ask a question or make a comment, she'll be glad to talk to you while you're in line for a book. And uh, that's it. Oh, no, the till exhibit. Don't forget, the new till exhibit upstairs. It's great opportunity to go take a look at that. For now, help me thank. Thank you. 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 Thank you.